morning. It's good to see you all. Appreciate the presence of each and every one of you. Just echo what Kurt said in the announcements. You're visiting with us. We're glad you're here. Be sure to get one of those welcome packets on your way out that we can thank you for being here this morning. You're an honored guest, and you would be our friend. If you have a Bible question, if you have need of prayer, if we could sit down with you and study through them, maybe teach the gospel if you've never heard the gospel before, um, or you, you have prayer, we would, you would be our friend if you make that request known um, after services or at the time of the invitation. Quick little things, uh, just a reminder if you need a, uh, a, normally it was normally announced, but if you need a, once you fill out that visitor's card, put it in one of the backs up front or in the back, and that's also where you can deposit your contribution if you did not have an opportunity to do so yet already. Um, song of invitation number four, 502. Number 502 will be the song of invitation if you're following along in the book. Just mark that right now. Um, by way of introduction to this lesson, um, student of history, that's what my background is in. I was halfway through my history degree when I decided to preach, decide, called, whatever you want to call it. That's how it happened. And I, I've collected things over the years. One of the former elders here, Harry Mann, on January 1st, 1990, I believe it is, wrote a document. A uh, 40-year history of the congregation here. That was some 20 years ago. Um, and in that time, he, he recalled of the original members, how many elderships there have been, who they had for meetings and preachers, to the best of his knowledge. Um, the one oddity in that preacher list, well, there was two oddities. One was Del Wettiger, the only man who had preached here twice. Once as a young man, not married, and when he came back the second time, was married and had a whole bunch of kids. And the other oddity was, of course, Brother DeLong, who was here longer than anyone of 39 years. But I bring that up because since 1953, this congregation has had an eldership. They've had, this congregation has had sound men guiding and shepherding the flock. That's almost unheard of in Oregon, or in the Northwest, really, to have a continuous eldership in place for nearly the entire history of the congregation. That's some 68 years. And I'm not trying to sing out one elder today, but Maurice Baker's been in there for 30-plus of those years. That's also unheard of, and we should be thankful for that. Currently, we have those four, four godly men shepherding us. Currently, you know, we are the flock underneath their charge, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, as well as Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 would cite that. They are to shepherd the flock of God among them, and the Holy Spirit has made them overseers of that. It is a work. Make no mistake about that. It is a work. It is a, oftentimes a thankless job. And we as the flock can make that job a joy or we can make it a burden. I know of one family where here they are three generations after their great-grandfather served as an elder and none of the men want the office. Because they're convinced that the eldership drove their great-grandfather into an early grave. And yet there's other men who have joyfully served in that office in that capacity for decades. And it has been a joy for them. The sermon this morning is something I intend to teach last week. We didn't have time to in Bible class. But we, we often talk about the work of elders, the qualifications. We'll debate until we're in the face about the qualifications of elders. But oftentimes we, don't, we forget what a congregation owes their elders. This morning's a simple lesson. I believe there's about eight things, eight important things from the scriptures we need to understand that we as members of the congregation, we as members of the flock, owe our shepherds. Because they give so much of their time to us. And just a, one, one last appreciation for them before we get in, in this lesson. We don't know how many heresies they have stayed off. We don't know how many threats they have protected the flock against. We don't know how many Christians they have kept faithful and kept on the path. Marriages saved. Wayward sheep brought back into the fold that these men have done. All the work that they've done. Because they don't go around waving the flag and saying, look at me, look what I did. They're humble servants. And oftentimes we can get 
to be but of a curmudgeon because we don't see it. We don't see the elders getting up and doing this publicly. And yet we fail to recognize that the reason this congregation has been at peace for as long as it has, it is as strong as it is, is because of the silent work of her shepherds. So what does the congregation owe their shepherds? Starting off in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, oh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. I forgot I was going to do this verse. This is going to come up quite a bit this morning in this lesson, but this translation words this verse is this, Hebrews 13, verse 7. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to you. New American Standard says that would be of no profit to you. It would not benefit you if the eldership viewed it as a burden and not a joyful work. Going back to the, going to that first verse there, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. Elders are to shepherd the flock of God among them. That's their task. We understand that. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 14. John chapter 10 and verse 14. He said there, I am the good shepherd. And the sheep know me. I know my own and my own know me. Shepherding involves a knowing of one another. And the elders make efforts to know the flock. They may not know all of us as, a, as intimate friends. That's hard to do when there's 145 plus people in a congregation. But they strive to know the members. The flock allotted to their charge. But this is a two-way street. And so because... We are in their charge. We are need to make an effort to appreciate them and to know them. Turn to the First Thessalonian letter, First Thessalonians chapter five and the ver verses twelve. We're going to be here for a few minutes here this morning, but it's First Thessalonians five verses twelve to thirteen actually teaches three things that we owe our elders. First Thessalonians five and verse twelve. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. We, this verse tells we are to appreciate them. That is to rightfully value them, to thank them, to recognize the full worth of. Where I came from the Northwest, it was a rarity for a congregation to have shepherds. Nationwide, it is a rarity for most congregations to have shepherds. Uh, that's according to Brother Wolfgang, who does a lot of speaking across the country and gets to see a lot of different congregations. And he estimates roughly 80 to 85% of our brethren are without shepherds. And sometimes I think, I think Arizona is this weird oasis. Because most of the church congregations I know of here have shepherds. That's amazing. And I think sometimes we take that for granted especially if we're second or third generation Christians that we've been in this congregation, our parents have been in this congregation, we've just always had elders. That's not the reality for most Christians. The reality is the, how do I say this nicely? The abomination that is men's meetings. I'm, not, I'm just going to put it out there. Um, of men, of godly men, who oftentimes will resort to ungodly means to, in order to get, quote, church business done. It's not the biblical model. So for us to have elders, that's that something we should appreciate and thank them for, to recognize the full worth here, for they do diligently shepherd the flock, oftentimes without thanks or any appreciation, which I did not plan this lesson with this in mind, but October in the religious world is, quote, pastor appreciation month. Now they mean they're preacher, but we can mean it in the biblical sense of our elders, that so much of the work that they do goes unnoticed and unrecognized. So we are to appreciate them. The next verse, in verse 13. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So the esteem there is to respect. And it's not just respect for respect's sake, but we're to esteem them high, respect them highly in love. This means we need to respect the man. There's this funny idea that, well, we often say it when the White House is, has a person in it that we don't agree with politically. It says, well, I can respect the office and not the man. 
There is no office without, without the man in the office. So you can't say that I respect the office of eldership, but the man in the eldership, well, I don't necessarily. No, they are one and the same. There is no office without the man in the office. And if the man was qualified and fit the character portrait that God gave to shepherd the, the, the man he wants shepherding his people, by the very nature of him qualifying for the office, if you want to use that terminology, he is a man worthy of respect. He is a man who has showed himself to be temperate, able to teach, he is involved in the work of the Lord, he is patient, he is hospitable. By all accounts, he is the picture of a godly man. And that is worth respect. We're to do so in love. And this is the same love that's due every believer. I would say to you 1 Corinthians 13, to be patient with one another, to, to endure with one another, to believe all things, hope all things, that we would owe that kind of appreciation as we do any other Christian. And this is owed to them because of the very nature of their work. He says in verse 13, because of their work. Again, we could, we could talk ad nauseum of the work of elders and shepherding. It is, it is tough work. This has come up in later in the lesson, but that's why in the first century, elders, there is a biblical right for them to receive remuneration or compensation for them to be supported because it is a full-time job. As we talk about in the class, if an elder does his work faithfully of admonishing the weak, excuse me, admonishing the unruly and encouraging the weak, let's not mix those two up, of doing the work, of teaching, of laboring, of counseling, of, of caring for the flock, it will easily take 40, 50, 60 hours a week if, they, if they'll let it. And these men often do it for nothing. They don't want to be compensated. It's a joy for them. They've taken this office willingly. But the very nature of their work demands that we respect them as we would any other brother or sister in Christ. Thirdly, we're to be at peace with one another. That's what the end of verse 13 says. We are to be at peace with one another. To, re, uh, to quote Hebrews 13, verse 17 again, let them do this with joy and not a burden, for this would be unprofitable for you. Be a sheep. This is, this is a goal I always have, whether I was a preacher or not a preacher. I wanted to be a member of the flock that the elders did not lose sleep over. I want to be a member of the flock where, you know what? We don't have to worry about him. We don't have to worry about brother so-and-so. They're, they're doing fine. In fact, we could call on brother or sister so-and-so to help in this matter if we wanted to. It reminds me... Growing up, I would sometimes complain to my father because, well, being the eldest, I thought that entitled me to certain birthrights, uh, such as the largest bedroom. It did not. I thought it entitled me to It did not. It entitled me to the bed they gave me. It was a fine bed. Um, but I remember I was, I was griping to him one time. Ellie and Zach get all the attention. Zach gets the biggest room. Ellie gets two mattresses in her room because she has friends over. Why, what do I get? And I remember he told me, and he's probably watching right now, which is fine. Hi, Dad. <laughs> My siblings aren't, so I can say this story. Son, you're like the Marine Corps. We can give you the hand-me-downs, and we're not going to have to worry about you. We sometimes worry about your brother and sister. Now, they turned out fine. My brother's a, a shop manager at a butcher shop. My sister's a preschool teacher. They turned out a-okay. But he told me, he's like, no, we, we don't have to worry about you as one of our children. You do your homework, you get stuff done. We have to give extra attention to your siblings. This is what's happening. And to apply this to the eldership, be a sheep. They, they, the elders can sit down and say, you know, you might be saying, well, why do I get any attention? Well, here's why you don't get any attention. You don't need it. You're solid. You're faithful. We know you're good. We're watching. Don't worry. We're paying attention. But there's other people out here. There's counseling that needs to be done. There's, there's people who need admonishment. There's people who need encouragement. And, and that might be the time where we're like, you know, you could probably help us in this. Why don't you go encourage brother so-and-so? Help out the elders here. I believe they're in the right to ask that. But we're at peace at one another because this brings peace for the eldership so they can focus on true issues. True issues. Not about 
petty disputes and bickering amongst the brethren. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Again, an obvious application of this. We are to submit and obey their rule. Verse 17 of Hebrews 13. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let's, let's pause there. I do aspire to the office of elder one day. Now, a lot of things have to happen first, like getting married and having kids and getting wisdom. But anyway, but it's with fear and trepidation that I think any man takes the office because he is held to a higher account. He is held to a higher standard by God. Not only will he have to stand and fall on his own at the judgment, he will have to give an accounting for how he stewarded the people of God, the resources that God gave him charge over. Did you shepherd according to my principles? Did you, share the, did you show the care and concern that I showed you? Did, you? did you admonish the unruly and encourage the weak? Did you faithfully be one of my shepherds? Or did you treat the eldership as kind of a, a board position that looked good on the resume? Did you treat the, the body of believers as a business instead of the family of God? Did you show the same care and concern that any other Christian should show each other, or did you bark orders? Make no mistake, elders have authority, God-given authority. And by the very nature of their qualifications and their wisdom, and the fact that God has appointed them through the scriptures, our default should be, especially when an, elder, an eldership makes a decision that we may not quite agree with, the default should be, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. If it's a big concern, I need to follow Matthew 18, and I need to go to them, and I need to talk to them as brethren, because that's who they are. They're brethren. But our default should be, if the eldership has made a decision, I need to submit to their rule and, and obey their, <clears throat> excuse me, their decision. Now, most of that eldering, is not figuring out what thus saith the Lord. What well, thus saith the Lord is clear. Most of the decisions are how do we apply this? What is appropriate? What is best? You know, our elders made a decision when we came back to Sunday evening. We didn't have a, quote, traditional Sunday evening worship. We had a Bible class. Because it seemed to be working at the time, and the elders thought, you know, this is, this is beneficial for the spiritual betterment of the flock. It was a decision. And we obeyed, and we submitted to it. One writer noted in Hebrews 13, verse 17, that the obedience here, that such obedience will benefit those who submit, since their souls will be cared for, and there will be harmony and joy in their mutual responsibilities. The leaders also remind that they will give an account. So the, the scriptures are not telling a potential elder or an elder that, hey, you have unlimited authority. You can just bark orders. No, you have to shepherd according to God's word. You're going to be held an account. And likewise, for those who are not elders, submit to the rule because they, have the, they are directed with the care of your soul. That's no small charge. And that ought to be going back to the esteem them. Which goes into something I touched on. Another thing we owe our elders is to not hastily speak ill of or rebuke them. I know tensions are still high. And maybe perhaps Christians everywhere have forgotten these principles. But these need to be reminded of. Turn to 1 Timothy 5 in verse 1. I bring in verse 1 because an elder, one of his, that's one of the descriptors, means he is an older man. Okay? For, to verse Timothy 5, 1 comes into play. Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, to younger men as brothers. Do not sharply rebuke. Do not be hasty in speaking ill of. Do not be hasty in bringing an accusation against, accusing, or rebuking. Now in 1 Timothy 5, verse 19, Timothy is instructed, that is the, that is the contextual context, 
But this applies to all Christians. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. This has been the consistent standard throughout all the Bible. The law taught any serious charge was not worth hearing and was not held any way except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Paul himself quotes that principle in Deuteronomy several times in the New Testament. So as a preacher, I have an obligation to shut down any accusation, any ill talk, any rebuking of eldership that is baseless or on the basis of only one witness. And we as members have the same duty. We are not to entertain that. Because here's what Paul goes on to say in verse 20. Or sorry, verse 21. Excuse me. A, I, I know I'm in the middle of a serious point, but I have to explain something. This part of my Bible is torn and, and pretty dirty, so sometimes I can't read the verse numbers right. 22. The principle applies here. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for their sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. If you, it's the same thing as gossip. If you receive gossip, if you allow it, if you will receive accusations, you will allow it. You have participated in it, and you share in the condemnation. The correct approach, if any Christian has a concern, has an issue, Matthew 18. If you want to turn there, Matthew 18. Now, I know the context here is dealing with church discipline. But the principles apply to our interpersonal relationships as brethren. Matthew 18 in verse 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a, tax, a Gentile and a tax collector. The appropriate course of action, if there's any issue, go talk to the elders. Because guess what? They are your brethren. And you owe them just like you owe any other Christian. A debt of love, as Paul speaks about in Romans. The obligation to love one another, 1 Corinthians 13. To be at peace with one another to be in harmonious with one another, to go to them in private as brethren to talk about the issue. Our elders here could tell you, especially Brett since he's here on Mondays and I come in the office on Mondays, we sometimes have very good discussions on Mondays. Concerns I have, questions I might have. Any of the elders could tell you that we've had these kind of discussions. We have a very good relationship, and it's not because I'm simply the preacher. I've known of some, relationship, of some preacher eldership relationships where it's like boss and employee, and they barely talk. That shouldn't be the case. The sheep should know their shepherds, and their shepherds should know their sheep. And it's a two-way street. But going back to the point, we need to be very careful with this. The work is very hard work. Not any man can serve as elder, and very few ever do. And that brings with it inherently respect for the office. And part of that respect for the office is not flippantly accusing or critiquing decisions. What it does demand is to go to your brother in private and speak to them as brethren. Now, beyond the serious point here, we are to remember them and imitate their faith. Going back to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, earlier in this 13th chapter, the Hebrew writer encouraged his readers to remember those who had previously been leaders over them. It seemed that the Hebrew Christians, some of their leaders had gotten killed in the persecution. But they no longer had them. And the Hebrew writer says in verse 7, Remember those who led you, past tense, who spoke the word of God to you, and consider the result of their conduct, Imitate their faith. I have 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 up there on the board. Because Paul also says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. If our elders are imitating Christ and being the examples and models of faith as character portraits in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 show them to be, they're worthy of imitation. 
And I find it very encouraging in the scriptures that Hebrews 11 is a whole bunch of people that the Hebrew RCDs are worthy of imitation. But here's the problem when we get into, when we get into learning sometimes. Sometimes it gets too above our heads. It's too theory. We can't see it play out. We, we, we sometimes, we can understand what the Bible's teaching on a doctrinal level, but we don't know how it really applies. It's one of the reasons why I believe God puts us in local churches, and that's how he designed the local church. But you don't understand how this verse applies? I'm going to give you a hundred different opportunities to see how the gospel and my teaching is lived out. The elders have lived long enough to be faithful to their spouses, to raise dependable children, to be show themselves an example of godly conduct. And in a way, God is saying here that if you need to find out how to live by the precepts of the Word of God, look at your elders. They have, they have shown themselves to be examples of the faith. If you have questions, go talk to your elders. God didn't put shepherds in the flocks just so they could balance the budget and count the contribution. They are here as resources for us and to care for our souls. Not only that, we are to consider them worthy of double honor. I mentioned this earlier in the lesson. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Now, contextually, Paul was speaking of financial support. Now, why is this? I made the point in classes before. The model of having the evangelists, a locate evangelist, do all the teaching, that's a rarity in the New Testament. You have Philip, the evangelist, who was at Caesarea uh, for 30 years. It's biblical. Paul, the apostle, was at the school of Tyrannus for a little over two years. It's a biblical model. But the overwhelming pattern you see in the New Testament is that because shepherds are to be able to teach, that's one of their qualifications, it is shepherds who are doing majority of the teaching. Hence why they are also entitled as anyone who preaches the gospel to get their living from the gospel. 1 Timothy 5, looking at verses 17 and 18. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now, contextually, does that mean financial support? Yes. Expanding it out in the principle. It means generous support. Our elders don't need the financial support, but what they do need is our overwhelming support emotionally, spiritually, through the prayers, encouragement. You know, sometimes you just sending a card of thanking them for their work comes at the right time. I remember I was, a couple years ago, I was thinking back on the professors I had in college that really had helped me, and one of them, one was Dr. Garrison. I kind of kicked myself for not taking his classes sooner because he was a very down-to-earth man, um, very smart. His speciality was pre-law, southern law history, and uh, history of the First Nation peoples of the American Southeast. Uh, I know. <laughs> Fascinated me. Anyway. But he was very down-to-earth and practical. He ended up being my unofficial advisor because my actual advisor assigned to me didn't know what they're talking about. Uh, he made sure I gra graduated on time. I just sent him an email thanking him for the impact he made on his life. And he told me, he says, I'm so glad you sent that because that came after a whole week where I was questioning everything I was doing and teaching. Dealing with unruly students, he, just, he had a rough week. Brethren, would it surprise you that our elders sometimes have rough weeks, rough days, where they need our encouragement just as much as we might need our, their encouragement? Because elders are people. They're not super Christians. They're people. They're brethren who need our overwhelming support, especially when they're dealing with hard issues, issues we may not know about. My default anymore is I just assume that the eldership is probably dealing with something difficult because that's part of their job. It's part of the work. And so a thank you, encouragement, I appreciate you men. It can do more than you know for their benefit, and your benefit. But if we get a discouraged eldership, Lord help us all. It's going to be very hard for them to be effective when they themselves are not able to be encouraged and continue on the faith. 
And finally, if this wasn't obvious, in James chapter 5, verse 14, know how we really support our elders? Know how we really encourage them? Go to them when we're really in need. James chapter 5 and verse 14. He speaks of what to do when we're sick, but the principle applies. He says, if, Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and he has committed sins, they will be forgiven of him. I believe the, the, these men have voluntarily taken this work. Somebody went to them and said, have you considered serving? Some of them needed time to think it over. But ultimately, they made the choice of just, yes, I, I will serve in this capacity. They do so because I believe at an elder's core is the desire to help brethren. You meet certain men that you just know at their very, at your very every fiber of being, they were born to be a shepherd. They just have the temperament, the mentality, the attitude, and they're good at what they do. We can support our elders. It's to call on them. To call on them when Satan's attacking us. When we can't take one step further on the road of faith and we need encouragement. To call on them when we need the prayers. Call on them so they can actually do the work God has called them to do. Not because brother so-and-so misspoke on the Lord's table. Or Brendan preached 15 minutes too long. Or the song service wasn't the way I liked it. Things that are really... And I will raise both hands. I have made those phone calls, okay? But things that are really petty bickering. And that's a confession of my, from my, myself there, right there. Calling them with the true spiritual work of shepherding. That they can actually engage in this great spiritual work God has given to you. Because guess what? Shepherds have shepherd's crooks. And a shepherd's staff should be a sign of comfort to the sheep. And a sign of fear and terror to anyone or anything that would threaten the flock. The shepherds do not have their staffs for nothing. Surely there's more I could have said this morning, more we could have gone into. But we owe a debt of gratitude to our shepherds here, especially over the last coming on two years. They weathered the storm, they charted a course, and their overwhelming concern was not only the physical well-being, but the spiritual well-being of the flock. And throughout all of it, they were overseeing it, they were trying to find the best way forward. And they've been, they've been doing that for decades. So maybe, and I don't want to be cliche about this, but today, tomorrow, this week, next week, say thank you. Encourage them. Think back of all the times the elders have been there for us. Let's support them. If you're here this morning, and you have not yet obeyed the gospel. You're in luck. You're in a good, op you're a good place with brethren who, who want to help you, Christians who want you to be saved. Um, if you turn in Acts chapter 2, we're going to be saying this next week, but in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles preached the gospel for its first time, that is the whole gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. He had ascended, so all that has happened when they, were, when they convinced the crowd, when they convicted the crowd of their sins, you had a man who interrupted Peter preaching. And he said, brethren, what shall we do? That is, what shall we do to be saved from our sins? In verse 38, Peter said to them, repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. 
The gospel is simple for our benefit. If you believe that Jesus came and lived the life, died as a sacrifice on your behalf, and was risen on the third day, and stands ready to make intercession for you, if you will trust the provision of his grace by becoming obedient to the gospel, by uniting your life in the waters of baptism and remission of your sins, we can assist you with that this morning. There is water ready. Maybe you've done that in the past and you're not living right. You're living in sin and that needs confessing. Or perhaps you're struggling and you need the prayers of encouragement. I'm more than happy to talk with you if you would come forward. Any of our elders, since I just spoke on that, any of our elders would be more than willing to sit down with you and, and study with you and, and pray with you and pray for you. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, once you come, say we stand and sing the song that's been selected.